I contemplated going anyway, but I knew that it was it was the other Keith Thomas, just by the name of the artist, because it's a rap artist and I don't do rap music. So I called her back and I said, okay, I, I was going to have fun with him, but I'm not going to make you guys go to the expense of flying me out there. It's like this, you're looking for the other Keith Thomas. She's like, oh my gosh, that would have been so funny if you walked in the room, you know. <laughs> Well, uh, again, I appreciate you doing this. Um, first off, where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Conyers, Georgia. Uh, that's, about, that's about 20 miles southeast of Atlanta. Um, okay. I barely even recognize the place now. It's changed so much. Oh, wow. A little, little hick town, Georgia redneck. Amazing. Well, what about music? Do you come from a musical household? I do. My dad, um, my dad was a hillbilly musician. Oh, cool. Um, I tell everybody we have two families by the same parents because the first half of my mom and dad's life, I have two brothers that were like 25 years older than me. My oh, youngest wow. brother was like 25. Yes. Yeah, so they were like my dad's. And, um, but my dad was a hillbilly musician. He played with the Sons of Pioneers, Pop Eckler, a bunch, bunch of hillbilly guys back in the day. And then came a preacher. And uh, that's after my, my brothers moved out, my sister and I came along. I have a sister four years uh, older than me. Okay. And so we started a little family group and it was a uh, little Keith and the Thomas family. And we would travel around South and, uh, and sing. I made my first record when I was nine and wow. another one when I was, when I was 13. Yeah. yeah. And so I tell everybody my first production was, was uh, the one when I was 13, because I was like literally walking around the studio telling everybody what to play. And I'm going, looking back on that now, they're probably going, what a brat, you know, it's like, <laughs> we don't need you to tell us what to play. But, sure, uh, but that's yeah, that was, amazing. That was I, I mean, uh, nine, you record your first record and you said you, were, you guys were doing like little touring down in the South as well. Yeah, we we had a thing where we would go, you know, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Florida. Um, and we used to travel with a group called the, uh, the Beaten Bows and we'd travel in their bus. Uh, Charlie Beaten Bow left the group uh, I, after we all had gone away, but he had went with the Sunlighters. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but uh, huh. they're a gospel group. But okay. uh, we toured with them quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I was uh, my dad put the guitar in my lap on the bed. Gosh, I must have been five or six years old, and it was too big for me to hold. And so I would just play the neck, right? Mm -hmm. And then we started going to church, and he would put it in a chair uh, up in in the front of the uh, church, and I would stand and play and sing in church, you know. And then um, you know, when I was nine, we somebody said, "Hey, you guys want to make our EP?" So we did. And it's, it's pretty funny because uh, I play it for my wife and she just gets a kick out of it because I was country. I was talking like Ish on there, singing like Ish, you know, and uh, with a big with a country accent. And I love that, you know, it's, uh, I wouldn't trade that for anything, you know, that experience. Were you, who was writing the songs? Was it your dad? We were doing cover songs like, oh, uh, cover songs. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever was going on, like with the Happy Goodmans, the inspiration, the Thrasher Brothers and all those guys at the time, it was Southern gospel. Okay. Um, yeah, and then little Steve Sanders was uh, Steve Sanders was big back in that time, and so uh, I got compared to him quite a bit during during that period. But um, we had some fun times, and you know, of course, my dad being the minister, we were in church twenty four seven, whatever. I bet. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was and it probably was playing. Time. I mean, it sounds like you were were performing in the church all the time as well. All the time. Well, you know, I tell everybody, I don't know how we did this because we were poor, so. We didn't have an inside bathroom, a hot running water until I was like 13. So oh, my wow. dad somehow afforded uh, for me to have a steel guitar, a drum set, a piano, all of these things. And I learned how to play them. You know, when I was 16, I, I got a four track recorder. And that's kind of where I started learning to uh, layer sounds. I would just, I would record a part, I would record maybe three parts, bounce that down to one track and record more and do vocals and layer them and that sort of thing. And that's, that's where I really started recording. But um, yeah, I mean, growing up, I, I started playing piano probably 15 or 16, and, and I would play literally eight hours a day. I have a vision of my mom uh, bringing in a plate of fried chicken and laying it on the piano and walking out, and that's it, you know, because I would just play and play and play. And uh, I'm, eight hours is no exaggeration. It might have been longer, but that, I would just sit there and play forever. Wow. And, um, yeah. Yeah, we're trying. We have two kids, but the, our younger son, um, we've been. He's only he's six. So I've been. We've been trying to like put put music, uh, you know, in his way. Like the earlier, we, the better. Yeah, yeah, we have a piano in the house, a keyboard. Uh, but he we started him off at drums. He was when he was four. 
uh because covid and it was like yeah. he had so much energy and we're like what do we do like he's you know he can't really go outside so we got him like an electric drum set so he could put his headphones on and just beat <laughs> on him forever and he never really had lessons until we moved here and he had a guy for a while um but he's uh one of like a hired gun musician who will for tours so he was always gone you know he'd be like gone for three months then he'd come back and then he'd oh, wow. be in town for a little bit so we we haven't found any we haven't really got him back in lessons but like he he enjoys it i mean he he picked it up but he's been on the piano quite a bit lately but i and i cool. asked him if he wants lessons but he's always like no and so i think i might just i should just let him just do it i mean i yeah. wanted him to get lessons so maybe but I don't know if I don't want to be the parent that pushes him into it. And then he's like, I hate this. I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, that's it. He's got, it's got to be his idea. My thing is, I, my parents, well, of course, our house, when I first started playing, it was, it was about, I mean, the size of this room, no kidding. It was so small. Wow. But my parents never really, I never heard them say, Keith, stop, stop, stop. You know, and I would play drums and steel, whatever I had at the time. And I never heard them say, would you please stop? You know, so that's great. That's important, you know? yeah. 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 We never. Yeah. Ex yeah, exactly. We just went with the electric because I'm like, we were living that's in a smart. town home at the time. And his room was literally the wall to the next person's house. I'm like, it's COVID. Everyone has stuck in ha in the house. And the last thing I want to do is be have him smashing drums at four no and kidding. the neighbor being like, are you kidding me? Not only am I stuck inside, but I've got to listen to this <laughs> like all day. Well, if we'd had electric drums back then, I'm sure I would have had those because yeah, my, totally. I'm sure I would have caused a lot of pain to my parents. But I just <laughs> Well, that's pretty incredible. But so but at 13, well, actually, so at 16 is when you got the four track you're talking about recording. And at that right. point, were you writing your own songs? Are you still kind of just figuring out covers and then layering covers? I was playing and doing parts. I really didn't know I was writing, uh, but I didn't write my first, I wrote my first song. I, um, I played drums. I started playing drums for a group on Word Records called Sherrod Brothers back in the day. Um, let me back up. After I got out of high school, I had an offer to go to New York and act. And I, I took my dad with me to a rehearsal at the Alliance Theater in Atlanta. And something happened on stage. It really was pretty innocent, actually. But being a primitive Baptist minister, he grabs, grabs me and says, you're not going to New York. And so that was the end of my acting career. So I went on the road with a Christian group um, and started playing drums. And then I went and moved over to piano. And I played for them for about three years. And that was when I wrote my first song. My first song was a song called Song for the Heart. And it was the title track of their album. And wow. uh, from there, I started writing. Yeah. Yeah. So right, right off the gate, you, I mean, you write a song and it becomes like a, you know, they obviously validate yeah. it and they're like, wow, okay, we like this song. Not only that, we're going to name the record this. I know, right? I was like, oh my goodness. And you know, it's like, I remember sitting in Buddy Huey, who was the head of the label at the time in Waco, Texas, and listening to the song for the first time. Um, and at that point it had strings and all this stuff on it. And I mean, I'm just crying like a baby because I'm, you know, I'll, I'll cry at the drop of a hat, but it's like, <laughs> that was so emotional hearing my first you know song being produced out like uh Bergen white produced the song and it was like gosh it was amazing I'll never forget That's that incredible so yeah. you play with the, do you just continue playing with that band and only had can i mean contributed obviously the 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 title of the record in, in that big song but um do you stay with them and are you do you continue writing with them at all or uh, from there how do you like what was kind well, of the next I, move I, yeah, I was, I was, I was like the MD and you put the okay. band together and that sort of thing. But uh, after three years, I left the group and continued writing. And I, uh, I wrote a song um, that I thought sounded like Ronnie Millsap. So I did a little de demo on my, I, did, I had two songs actually, uh, did a little demo on my Fender Rhodes. And um, it's funny because Ronnie was playing in Atlanta at the time. That's where I was living. And mm -hmm. um uh, I called the venue. This is crazy. I called the venue where he was playing and actually got his brother-in-law on the phone and told him I had a song for Ronnie. And oh, he, wow. I don't, I don't think that would happen today. But he said, yes, yeah, send this to Rob Galbraith in Nashville at Ronnie, uh, Ronnie's office. And so I did. And so I sent it out. Totally forgot about it. About three months later, I get a call from Rob at my mom and dad's house. And, he, and I'd, I'd signed it, Brian Keith Thomas. And he said, hey, Brian, this is uh, Rob from Ronnie Millsap. He said, I, uh, I got your cassette. I threw it in the trash, but something made me take it out. And I listened to it, and I love these songs. Can you come to Nashville and, and do the demos? So I'm like, of course. Are you kidding? Duh. 
Yeah. So that weekend, I, I, I that weekend I come to Nashville and um, ended up doing those two demos. We said we're starting a publishing company. Would you be our first staff writer? And that was how I got to Nashville. And, wow. Um, I know it's like it's like it was. I, I can't even tell you what Ronnie Millsap did for me. And Rob, Rob was, and Rob and I are still incredibly close. I mean, one of my dearest friends. Now I can't even tell you how much he means to me. Um, so. Ra Ronnie offered me a deal to go on a road with him. He wanted me to be the MD and he gave me 20 minutes in front of him to perform. And my wife and I at the time had just had uh, our first child. So I didn't feel comfortable leaving her by herself. And so I passed on that. But when he was on the road, he would give me a studio. And this is Ground Star Laboratory. It was like at the time, the state of the art recording studio. And that's okay. where I really learned to produce. I would I could spend all day in there if I wanted to when he was out of town. And um that's where I that's where I really kind of perfected the craft or at least uh, got it to a place where people would uh, pay attention, you know. Wow. Just for for people that are listening or, or watching that don't, you know, like when you sign a publishing deal, just you you are basically a songwriter, right, for for them. And they what then take the song and try to pitch it out to other artists. Correct. Right. Exactly. OK. And yeah. so when when you, you when sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, they, exactly. It's like you, you, um, they, you write a song, they pitch it to other artists that are recording, which, you know, that, I mean, it's still a viable way to become a songwriter. It's not, uh, I, mean, I think the figure is 80% of the songwriters that were working in 2000 are gone, but still, Whoa. There are, I know I have some friends that, that still do that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a different business now, but um, um, that's, that's how I got to Nashville. That's interesting. So well, you said so nowadays a lot of the people are the, the publishing companies aren't signing just songwriters or there's just so there many are. that I mean, no, no, they are. But it's like, you know, back in the day, you could you could make a living off of uh, album cuts, but you can't do that now because of streaming. And um, yeah. So if you don't have the hit, you're really not making that much money, you know, right. and um, that's kind of the, the theory now is like you want to do this. You want to get the single. If you get the single and it becomes a hit, you're making some money. Right, right, right. right. That's it. But if you get an album cut, it's like just maybe just one song on your resume to possibly open the door to another writing session or, or something of that nature. Right. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, if you're doing, if you get an album cut on a, on an Ariana Grande or any, uh, you know, something oh, like that, that's sure. uh, tons about, you know what I'm saying? It makes a difference. Right. But uh, just, in, just in general, it's, it's really difficult uh, just to live in that songwriter space, you know, mm -hmm. uh, now, as opposed to back, back in the nineties. Right. Um, I was at Sony for, for about 10 years as a staff writer and producer. Um, so uh, you know, I, I was I, I lived in the good old days, is what they're calling. You know, because like that was when you know the money was crazy back in the day. You know, my budget right. for producing a record was anywhere from eighty to thousand dollars to do a song. You know, one That's... song, and people when I tell kids that now is like, what? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's that funny. it's um, unreal yeah. to think about. Just but the amount of how accessible things are. I mean, you could re record a song on an iPhone, right? I mean, nowadays. Exactly. But before you had to be in a studio, which is costing an hourly rate, and you got to hire the people who actually know how to use the big equipment. And I could see how it gets expensive. Uh, when nowadays right. it's just like you could have a laptop and or a, a, like a phone, right, and produce something halfway decent. Absolutely. The, I mean, the, talk about the play, the, the field being leveled. It's um, at the time I was the first one in, in Nashville to have a 3348. Uh, we recorded Save the Best for Last on that. And, um, you know, that machine alone is $180,000. And uh, yeah, and then you have a console that's a sale is anywhere from six to a million, you know. And, um, you know, it just, I, I was telling everybody, like, I had the Synclavier as well. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a digital uh -huh. re recording. It's like a DAW, it's like a digital workstation. Uh -huh. um, and so that, I think we paid 120000 for that. But, you know, you take that now and you compare it to what Logic is for 200 bucks, you, Logic kills it. I mean, you can't, right. it's, it's not even comparable, you know. So tech, technology has definitely leveled the playing field quite a bit. And so everybody's got opportunity. And I think that's great to some extent. I mean, you know, look, not everybody should be making records, but at the same time, everybody gets a chance to try. And that's how, that's how it works, you know, and I'm competing mm -hmm. now myself with guys that are making records for, 
I don't even know, maybe 500 bucks or a thousand or 2000, you know, which I've tried to keep my fee at a reasonable rate, but it's like, you know, because of the creator tools and what's going on technology wise, especially now coming with AI, it's, it's getting oh, a little, AI is okay, wild. it was crazy. Yeah. I mean, some of the stuff that you can do now and, and, and we're just on the front end of it. It's like, this is going to uh, turn some heads and, and actually, you know, it's going to cause me and myself just to kind of go out and figure out an, uh, another revenue stream because it's like people are going to be doing AI tracks for free, basically, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's my wife is like way into AI and she's been into it for a while now and just seeing I am too. her doing some of the things that she can do with it. It's like, it blows my mind. She'll just type something in and be like, organize these, you know, videos and blah, blah, blah. And it'll just go brrr, something that would take you, you know, hours yeah. to it just is done in literally seconds. It's so right. bizarre. I mean, um, uh, I'm doing a piano piece. I mean, I'm doing a piano series and I won't say the name of the person nor the company, but um, initially um, I only had one track and, and, a lot of a lot of the DSPs work off of volume. So mm -hmm. uh, the gentleman asked me to go to a, a site, an AI site, and create nine other pieces. And um, so I, I did. I went on the site. I only got as far as like two pieces, but um, it's pretty scary how good it is, you know. So what we we're going to do is we're going to do nine pieces AI and one of mine, and kind of use it as a test to see how well you know it works. Oh, it works but, up uh, next to it. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the good thing about this particular company is that um, when you do the AI track, you actually get the stems that it used and the, and the piano roll. Well, piano roll is basically the notes out on your uh, computer screen. So you can actually edit those notes if you wanted to. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, so I mean, I don't know if you can see this on my screen. A little bit, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. This is the piano roll here. So these are individual notes. When you, when you go here, they just um, they disappear. Ah, that's not supposed to happen. Um, uh, but let me show you what I'm talking about here. Yeah. So there, I mean, this is the piano roll and it, you know, each one of those represents a note. And, uh, and so you can actually edit those from this AI company. You know, they actually figured out how to do that. And that's, I'm like, how are they doing that? You know? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. It's so it's, it's, it, it's hard to even like wrap my head around it and, and the, what it can do. And there's the, you know, I've heard other people talk about you can have it, you know, write a joke in someone's voice or like how, how they would do it. And it's like, what? Like it, yeah. the computer, it'll just create something and it'll be in the same, you know, way or th that somebody else would speak and it makes too much sense. And you're like, Oh my gosh, computers yeah, are just well, taking over. That, that part of it, that part is the deep fake part of it, which is like, I mean, that itself is pretty scary. Um, yeah, there's uh, there's a there's a uh, Joe Rogan thing out right now on that, that that he's got a piece that somebody took his voice and his face and everything and they manipulated it. So I don't know. I don't know where this is going to go, but it's uh, pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, OK, well, going back to, you know, you and your in your musical journey. So you you know, what was was there like a moment? Obviously, you you had these moments where you get a publishing deal and you're working with these artists. Like what was the first song that you or was there a song even maybe around that time period that you wrote and you're like, I know the song is going to be a big hit. And then it became like, or, or was there a song that you wrote and it, what was like the first like major, like milestone, like life-changing song that you had written? Do you remember? Well, yeah. I was, so when I was at word, uh, Don Kaysen was my publisher there and I, I was into jazz at the time, you know, okay. and it was like, so I was playing all these 12 finger chords <laughs> And he was like, Keith, I want you to just write a song, three chords, and um, and and no more. And so I said, okay. So I did, and that was my first number one on the Christian charts. It was uh, only for the love of the Lord, and wow. Michael Sharber. Yeah, and uh, so that that taught me a lot. And some someone pulled me aside one day and said, if you want to really have real success, you need to push that jazz stuff to the side. You can still do it, and it's great for you know, it's, it's great to keep your chops up and all that, but I, so I kind of abandoned that for a minute and started focusing more on pop music. Um, and at that point, i would already gone down the road with, uh, like R and B stuff with the stylistics and, mm -hmm. uh, OJs and all that stuff. So I had that. And Michael Jackson was one of my, uh, I've learned on a lot of that stuff, 
but um, you know, it, it was just one of those things where I had to learn what a hit song was and how to write that. So, you know, when I was at Word, I ended up, I was there for about six years, ended up with over 20 number one records while I was there. And then I left Word and started my own publishing company, production company. And that's when I uh, met B.B. Winans and we got him signed to uh, Sparrow Capital. And so that stuff really launched the pop side of things for me, even though it was gospel. Mm -hmm. That's how I got a call. I got a call from uh, Ed Eckstein at, at uh, Mercury uh, for Vanessa Williams and because he heard the, the BB and CC wine and stuff. And so, um, and so I, I, at that point, I started writing more pop music and I had this thing, a little piano hook and or keyboard hook and a lyric, baby, baby, uh, heart in motion, whatever. And I played it for Amy Grant and she loved it, you know. So we made that record and that's one of the ones that I would say that I knew, you know, from the minute I finished that, that it, this, this is a hit. It's going to be a hit. And uh, even, even Save the Best for Last, I'll, I'll tell you the story about that. Um, I went to New York uh, to meet with Vanessa. It's a funny story. I walked in the room and uh, first thing out of her mouth was not, hey, how are you? It was like, you're white. Because I've done all this BB and CCY and stuff. Right? Sure, yeah. So, so the room falls apart, you know, laughing and everything. But um, you know that 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 I wrote eight songs. I think it was when I took I took eight songs with me to New York. Um, and Ed said to me, he said, "I'd love for Cynthia Wilde to write the lyrics." And I said, "Sure." I didn't have, had no clue who Cynthia Wilde was at the time. And so by the time I got back to my hotel, he had faxed me her discography, and I was so embarrassed because. It was like I just one hit after another. I was like, oh, my God, this is intimidating. So um, anyway, so we I did connect with her on that. And then after we'd gotten in the studio, Ed sends me a cassette and it has four songs on it. And the fourth song was Save the Best for Last. And he said, pick one of these songs because we want to do one of these. But you pick which one you want to do first. And uh, so that was the one I, I picked. I said, this is a smash. This is like this is amazing. And I called the songwriters uh, that day and I said, look, um, I'm just going to tell you up front, if this is not a hit, it's my fault because this song is a hit. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I was very careful about it. I wanted to make sure that it was. And, and we, you know, the record came out, the, the album came out rather. And it was like, um, it was, all, it was there were three singles deep and it still hadn't come out. And so I'm calling Ed, I'm going, Ed, this is the hit. Are you please, you know, he said, it's coming. I promise it's coming. And so sure enough, that was a, I think it was, it was the third or fourth single. But that's kind of what turned things around for that record, I think. And that was, and it's not because of me; it's because of the song. The song is just so well written, and so you know, it's like it's one of those things where I don't have very many things fall in my lap, but that one did, and that was like it. You know, you just embrace it and know when it's when it's right, and that one was. So, mm -hmm. um, but that was one of those too that I knew that this is a smash. So yeah, I mean, you've worked with so many amazing, I mean, massive artists, and. And written so many huge songs that I would have never, you know, it, just looking at your discography and it's like, whoa, the same person wrote this song. And this, I mean, you wrote that the huge hit for Selena. Right. I mean, that if I could, I, I mean, I could fall in love. It's like if I hear, if I see Selena, I see a T-shirt. That's the first song that I think of. Oh. oh and I mean, yeah. like, oh, thank you. Yeah. She's a legend, right? I mean, how do you pitch something to her? And, and, and especially in a bilingual, uh, from a yeah. bilingual artist, like how, how did that song come about? And like, how was that pitched to her? Well, I got a call from Nancy Brennan uh, at, um, it's got the label now. Hmm. Uh, but she got, she called and asked me to um, take a meeting and sent me a video on Selena and I watched it. I just absolutely immediately connected and fell in love. And my manager at the time and I, we agreed to do the album. Then it got where I was just going to do like half the album because my schedule had gotten crazy. But uh, she come, she came to Nashville and I met with her. We definitely connected there. And uh, I had, had I could fall in love, you know, and, and I had a track that I played for. I had two songs that she fell in love with while she was in Nashville. And um, so, you know, those are the two we agreed to. And so... She goes away and comes back the, the next time to record the vocal. I finished out the song and the track and that sort of thing. And um, I'll never forget her uh, luggage uh, got lost. And so she's uh, she come, comes to the studio and she says, uh, my luggage is not here and I'm going to go to Walmart and get it some a new wardrobe. And I said, okay. So she takes off. I'm still working on the track. Uh, and she comes back with all this food. She said, I'm going to cook you guys a Mexican feast. And um, 
at the time, the studio I owned at the time was the Bennett House in Franklin. And um, uh, Winona was working down the hall and started smelling this food cooking. And she goes down and she thought she was our chef. And she asked Selena, she said, would you, if we buy the food, would you mind cooking for us too? <laughs> Selena said, of course, let me just see what, what, when Keith might need me. She said, wait, you're the artist? <laughs> so that whoops. was, that was uh, yeah, whoop, that was so, <laughs> oh my gosh, it was so funny at the time. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, this is one of those times where you know you're working with uh, someone that, I mean, had things not happened the way they did, she would have been, she would have been an, um, an icon. She was a massive artist and there's no question in my mind, you know, the level she would have been playing at. But she, um, you know, we, we, we did this song, I Can Fall In Love, and I had written uh, a Spanish part in the middle, I don't speak Spanish, but I'd written a Spanish part in the middle. And, I um I did the demo with me doing it and I thought she was gonna die because she was laughing about it, you know, and we had fun. That that was the thing. We laughed and we had fun and we liked each other and you know it was just you know it was a good fit. And uh, I'll never forget I'm sitting at the console, she's standing in the back of the studio and she said, Okay, I'll see you guys in two weeks because she was coming back to do the next song and never got to see her again, you know. Oh my gosh, um, that's when that all happened. Yeah, and so that following week I'm taking a break i'm working on her song that we just started recording and i walk out in the hall and the studio manager daryl bush uh he, my buddy he said uh selena's dead and i'm just like what and i honestly had a physical pain in my heart and i go what are you talking about she said she's been murdered and i go what so i go back in the studio i turn it on turn on the tv and sure enough it's already on the tv and i'm like i mean i was i was gutted i had to leave the studio i didn't work the rest of the week it was just that emotional you know Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. And then, then having to finish the song, I didn't realize that having she to finish it. Yes. Yeah, she was, was already it. gone by the time before that even came out. Right. Yeah. Oh my and, gosh. Uh, I didn't realize that. That was, that was tough. I have to tell you. And she was such a sweetheart. I mean, so likable, so sweet. And I don't know, there's just something about her that would have translated to everyone. I'm just going, what a tragedy, you know? Yeah. I mean, that must have even been emotional for you. Did you watch the biopic with uh, Jennifer Lopez? I did. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's at the very end of the film and she at, she's in the huge stadium and she's doing that song. Yeah. It's crazy. I I mean, um, yeah. And I, then, uh, you know, the series, I thought they, you know, they did a, a good job on the series too, on the Netflix series. Mm -hmm. um, but, but um yeah, the thing about it is just it's just so likable and so lovely, just a beautiful human being. And I just go, I can't even imagine someone doing this. You know, it's like, um, but we and it's funny because I reflect back on it and I think about the conversations we had about this person that was doing all these things for her and she was excited about her new clothing line and all this. And then the following week, it just ends. You know. Oh my gosh, it was that must have? I mean, to to have that happen and especially in the, was it difficult to go back and finish the, like, how long did it take you to go back and finish the record? Or was it, were you, I mean, I, I don't know, I guess if that lands on you and you have to finish the song and you're kind of in the midst of getting ready to, okay, this is going to be a big hit. And like, we're excited and she's going to come back and do another song. And then that happens. And is it like, right. Uh, well, I mean, surreal. how do you take I mean, that on? Surreal. I mean, yeah. You're listening, you're sitting in, in her voice is coming across the speaker and you're like, She's no longer here, you know, it's just she's not going to come through that door and do another song. It's like, this is it, you know, and I was like, that was such a weird experience. I have to tell you, it was surreal. Um, yeah, I don't oh know. Oh, my gosh. But I and I have to tell you, every time I mean, I and this song was on repeat on the radio for a long time. And I, like every time I relive that every time I heard it on the radio, you know, it's like that whole experience again yeah oh my gosh i can't again i can't even imagine especially to being like literally telling you know having her say i'll see you back in a couple of weeks i mean oh my gosh weeks, yeah. yeah and then having this i mean obviously her biggest one not her biggest song but a massive song especially her first at least an english speaking first one. or english yeah yeah, english, yeah 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 um yeah. yeah oh my gosh uh so i mean you but it's like looking at your career, I mean, like you've written the the, the scope of of songs and, and the people you've worked with is just so impressive. I mean, it goes. Aww. I saw that you were like on a Dr. Dre song on the aftermath. Like, I mean, 
no, no, that's not me. That that's not me. That is someone else. That is there. That's funny too. But I'm glad you brought that up because you know, and, and I I've, I've been blessed. I I have worked with everybody from Barbara Streisand to Whitney Houston, all these iconic yeah, voices. Celine Dion. But I mean, it, it, there's a, yeah. But there's an there's an urban Keith Thomas too, and he's oh, like, so somebody Brown, lumped you all together. Chris Brown, Dr. Dre, and I get that a lot. It's funny. I will tell you, uh, Jimmy Iovine. Um, who was a friend called one day and said, we've booked your flight uh, you know, to LA to work with, I mean, you named the artist or, she, or the secretary named the artist. And, uh, and I hung up and I, stopped. I contemplated going anyway, but I knew that it was, it was the other Keith Thomas, it was just by the name of the artist because it's a rap artist and I don't do rap music. So I called her back and I said, okay, I, I was going to have fun with him, but I'm not going to make you guys go to the expense of flying me out there. It's like this, you're looking for the other Keith Thomas. She's like, oh my gosh, that would have been so funny if you walked in the room, you know, so. But that's, oh, wow. Know. That's hilarious. Cause I, 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 when I was researching you, I didn't see that one. I would be like, oh, that, that would probably be a pretty notable yeah. thing just because of, it was, it was so out of left field like but right the credit it says is you're the composer so it's like it wasn't like oh he wrote the lyrics for something on the aftermath but it was like just it's funny i, I, tried, to I tried to contact him i was i'm going this would be funny for us to do a collaboration you know keith thomas and keith thomas you know but i've never oh yeah that. that's um, funny but but he's 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 definitely in the urban side on the rap side um like i said chris brown um yeah but i mean you've wrote now i mean huge pop hit so it makes sense i mean jessica well, simpson is that is that fans. i mean yeah, that, yeah Moore, I did, did, did. 98 right. degrees i mean all kind of in that same late to early mid to late to the early uh, 90s into the early 2000s i mean those were yeah, the Luther, Luther Vandross, James artists. Ingram, you know the uh, yeah. bryce and all those guys they're if, if it's on the r&b side it's usually me but if it's on the uh, hip-hop or rap side it's not so okay Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, is it like, I mean, to have, uh, you said you started your own publishing company. Are you still doing right. that now? I am. Yeah. Um, you know, I was at Sony for about, I was there for actually about 12 years, 10 years as a writer to three years as a producer. And then I went over to Warner Chapel for a while and wrote there, but, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm more in development now and, um, and I'm doing I, about five or six years ago, actually 2017, I started to help build a library for Facebook. So that's what's been keeping me. Um, if you're on Snapchat, uh, Facebook or Instagram and you need a piece of music for your video, you can just attach this music and it's free to use. So, uh, and we've delivered, good Lord, music from India, Japan, Africa, Middle East, you name it. And um, so that's 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 what i've been doing for the last four or five years and um and then I'm, i have my own publishing company i'm developing i'm managing um engelbert humperdinck's granddaughter right now who is a complete beast and um and so i'm working on a tv show with idea as well we're going back to india to shoot a pilot for that uh sometime april may so i'm doing i'm doing a, a, a variety of different things now not chasing top 40 as much if that were to happen that would be great but um, uh, because of where things are technology wise and, and just where we are in the media standpoint, you know, I'm like, I want to play in that field, you know, or do something other than just radio. So that's kind of what I've been doing. Wow. And with, with artist development, are, are you taking on songwriters and helping them kind of pitch to artists? Is that part of it or no, not at all? Well, I have been mentoring a, a few songwriters for the last uh, three or four years and um you know, I've got I've got one writer that is not my writer. I will tell you, I he he begged me to sign him back in the day, uh, or let's put back in the day, four years ago, five years ago. I go, look, this is not my wheelhouse. This is like uh, I, I'm I'm I feel like I'm really good at picking hit songs, but you need somebody that's going to take and pitch these songs and 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 that has that um, the foundation and the infrastructure to be able to do all that. And so I said, you just keep writing with anybody you can and and. So I used him a lot on my Facebook stuff and um, he just continued on to write. Now he's got a huge hit with um, Kane Brown right now. And, oh, wow. Um, thank God. Thank God. Yeah. And uh, and, and then I've, I've developed a, a young lady out of Canada, Megan uh, Nadine. Uh, we, we did a, an EP together and, um, and in, in the very beginning, you know, we started we started writing and working on these songs. And then, you know, you, you go down that road two years and you look at the growth and that's the that's the beautiful thing about it is like you see 
um, you know, you see something coming that's got potential, uh, potential, and it's got talent, and and they may not be fully developed where they need to be, but it's like where she was and where she is now is just a completely different artist, and she will admit that too, you know. And that's part of what it is. It's like taking you from ground from ground zero to where you're uh, able to go out and, and make a living at this. And um, you know, so for me right now, I've got I've got uh, a couple of acts that I'm working with, and and I'm I'm excited about one and. You know, we'll just see. It's one of those things about it. Is there's a carrot out there that's always being dangled, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm still chasing it, even after all these years. Is it easy to, I mean, not, I guess it wouldn't be easy, but um, if somebody approaches you, is it, it says, oh, you know, I'm a songwriter, I'm an artist, like to, because if you're on the songwriting side, if you're side on a, as a publisher, your songs are basically going to be pitched right it's not like okay i wrote the song i'm going to keep this i'm going to try to push it as my my own artist career right like so you have to kind of right you have to go into it knowing that you either want to be an artist and try to go that route or be a songwriter right, right. is that hard right. to i mean i guess if i was a song this is for people that maybe are songwriters in their own town or maybe they're getting pretty big around their the circuit of wherever they're from and they're like i'm going to move to nashville and i want to try to do this and would you if somebody came and they just want to try to get in whether it be a songwriter or, or an artist at, at that but what would you say like what would be their move do they come in like do, do you come in with a demo of your own songs and try to give it to the publisher and it's you singing and playing everything or how like i guess how do how does how does one get into that well i mean i mean obviously there's no formula but right from my from from my standpoint for me to take on an artist um i have to believe in that person and believe in their artistry and like i said it may not be where i think it needs to be to be able to go make records and get them out there it's like there may be some things that need to be developed during that process and that's when i when I think about uh, Megan, it's like when I started working with her, um, I believed in her talent and I mm -hmm. still do. And, um, you know, there's so many great things about her. And so we try to figure out, I always try to look at not just the music, but the, the person in general. And what else about, what else does this person have going on that we can actually tap into that people, especially now, because authenticity wins. Right. So what 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 other uh, personality traits or characteristics do they have that people would be interested in? And so you try to develop that part of it as well. But uh, for a publisher, I mean, a publisher signs a, a songwriter that has the ability to write, well, write hit songs, but they also have the ability to adapt to many different genres. And, 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 and that's I mean, that's important because they're going to be paying you a draw to be able to write songs you get you you know you may have to write eight to, to 12 songs a year whatever but um, those songs have to be cuttable you have, to have, you have to be able to get those songs cut to be able to earn that money back and so you know it, it's 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 even harder now because like we were talking about earlier is like if you don't have the single there's not much money there mm -hmm. so um you know that's and, and so publishers look at it from a different perspective than I do. Mine is, is I kind of, I kind of tell everybody that my whole thing is built around career design. I want to be able to take an artist from ground zero and see it all the way through, you know? And mm -hmm. so that, that's, that's my formula basically. Okay. Yeah. I think I just, it's just fascinating because if somebody went in as maybe they could write great songs, but it's like, you have to be able to present it. Right. You, so you'd have to know how to really sing it or whatever. So it would make, it would cut through and people would understand it. It's not, I'm a great writer or I don't know. It just, I, you have to have kind of, you almost have to have the full package anyway, if you're going to get signed on as a publisher or a songwriter or a, well, an artist. Obviously. Right. Well, I think the artist has to be able to communicate um, the, the song somewhat. I mean, there mm -hmm. are writers that don't sing and I'm, I'm not being disrespectful because I have the ultimate respect for Diane Warren, but she will tell you she's not the greatest singer, but she sings on some of her demos Right, and, you know, it's like she's one of the greatest songwriters ever, you know, mm -hmm. and a dear friend. So, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be to, to, to be able to write great songs. You just, you just don't. You just have to know how to craft those songs and lyrics and melodies together because, because that's what it is, is basically the perfect marriage of a lyric and a melody. And mm -hmm. it makes you want to listen to it again, you know. So, 
And then you would just, if you could do that, you could just ha have someone sing it and just be like, okay, here's my demo. Exactly. Got yeah. it. Okay. I guess that, that was more yeah. of my question. Like if you're a songwriter, maybe you know how you can, you know, you have these melodies and you can write great lyrics, but there's no way my voice would ever be able to do it. I just have it in my head. Like you would just right. try to get someone else to sing on the demo and then you'd present it like this is someone else, but I wrote the song and they're just performing. it. Right. Understood. Yeah, I mean, okay. that, I mean that, that that happens all the time. You and in Nashville, particularly, you have um, session singers that that's all they do is they do demos. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. that's the I, that's why this part of the the, the industry is so fascinating to me because I'm I'm sure that a lot of people that are you you'll see them credited as a songwriter or, or somebody that's wrote 15 hits, but you they you never hear their voice, right? It's just their they are the lyricist or they've done this or that, but Right. How would you even get in the door if, yeah, how would somebody be like, well, you're good, you can write lyrics really well. It's like, well, how, how would you even present that to anyone or how would they even care? But that makes sense. You'd have to have someone else kind of do the, the, the singing or the mu musical uh, part of it all. Right. Exactly. Got it. Interesting. Well, Keith, thank you, thank you so much for, for hanging out and having this conversation with me. I really, really appreciate it. Just, oh, it's so cool to hear you know, your journey in this and the, the amount of songs that you've written and the artists that you've worked with um, and kind of what you're up to now. I mean, I know you, you know, you, you talked about doing this Facebook thing and like developing artists. I mean, it's just so cool that you're able to, it's it hard to stay, you know, you have to constantly adapt, right? I mean, when you started on a four track at 16, it's so much different now than the gear you have right behind you. Right. Well, I was telling my son yesterday, it's funny you mentioned that, is like, he's kind of disheartened by, by AI. And I said, well, you know, it's a tool. I said, I, I, I reflect back on when I went from analog to digital. I said, people were right about going all digital. You know, there were guys that said, I will never go digital, right? But you couldn't give me a tape machine now. <laughs> I mean, I love right. the way it sounds. Don't, don't get me wrong, but I don't want to ever hear that tape rewind again, you know? So I just go try to think, so using it as a tool, and I said, you know, I, I honestly believe after playing with it and using it some, that there's got to be a, a human in the room that's going to go, that's right, or that's not, that's not right, or doesn't feel it, because it doesn't have the heart and soul that we have, and until, who knows if it will ever have that, I don't think it will, but at the same time, you know, I, I love technology, I love to be able to use that, and, and one of my things, I'm, you know, I've, I've been a huge fan of VR, and I believe that that's the next phase. I, I read the other day that you know Zuckerberg spending ten billion a month on VR because he believes in it so much. I had uh, four years ago, I had two VR parties at my studio, and oh, wow. uh, so I told I told Facebook when we started working, I said I want to be your VR guy uh, because I just feel like what's going to happen in healthcare and education is going to be unbelievable. I mean, can you imagine? And Disney's already mapped their parks for VR, so can you imagine a kid that's in the hospital and can't go to the park he can put the headset on and, and experience that full on just like he's there um and the, or you have someone that's getting dialysis or you're something they're being treated they can put the headset on and and just lower their blood pressure you know what i'm saying i think there's so many elements that to that other than entertainment obviously it's going to be great for entertainment but i i look at the educational and healthcare part of it as as the big uh thing for vr and i'm excited oh, yeah. i'm playing i'm playing in that space you know that's an interesting perspective because I was I've always think thought of like you know my my older son's way into meta and you know he, he has the the VR headset and all that stuff and I'm and he's right. like yeah people are gonna start selling real estate on here and I'm like who is gonna be sitting in their house with a headset on going like check out my my you know this house I just <laughs> spent money on but right. it may that never made that didn't quite I didn't but other people probably are like you know there it is it is necessary or whatever but anyway. Uh, to your point, that makes so much more sense to somebody that's in the hospital or, uh, you know, a kid that has cancer. Maybe they cannot ever experience Disneyland, Disney World, and they can put on a headset and they could literally be there walking around the park. Like that is life, literally, I mean, that's life changing for people. And it's just something I didn't even, that never has even crossed my mind, but that makes so much sense. Yeah. And even in, like in the educational part of it too, you're like, if you put the headset on and you have an instructor that's, halfway across the world you can be right there with them real right. time you know what i'm saying and it's like you're in the same room so I, I i love that part of it and i just think it's going to be 
Um, I, I, it's going to change the game. Our AI is changing the game already. We see that. And, and so I just feel like in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see a major transformation in how we communicate and media and that sort of thing. Oh yeah. I completely agree. It's, it's gonna, it's interesting, but, um, right. Thank you so much, Keith, again, for doing this. I have my last oh, question is I've, I've already kind of asked it like three times just because your knowledge is so um, incredible. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists, if, although you've been giving it I, the whole time. <laughs> well, no, but you know what? It's funny you say that because I, I, I get that a lot and I go, you know, for me, it's about uh, quality time alone and doing the work, you know, the work ethic is the most important part of this. And, and, and honestly, for the, for the emerging artists and the, and the young talent coming along, it's, it's a little unfair because now they feel the pressure to have to go and do three TikTok videos a day. And so, you know, that's just part, you can't really perfect your craft if you're out doing all this other stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's like spend the time to know your instrument, uh, to know your craft. And and then go do all of that before you know know all that before you try to engage with a, with a, with an audience because I think it's just important to, to to be at a certain level before you start putting yourself out there and you know it's just a work ethic I, that's for me it's like I still I'll still do a ten to twelve fourteen hour day you know and um, um, you know, I, I get up early stay up late and that's kind of been my life for the last thirty five years so. Bring me the best word.